Good morning, everybody on the West Coast, and good afternoon for everybody elsewhere or even in the evening in India. My name is Amy Gardner, and I'm co hosting this webinar about user experience. And I'd like to welcome and introduce you guys to Deborah Hirschman, who is Global Head of User Experience or UX and Client Platforms at Goldman Sachs. Our topic today is user experience, and we're going to take a deep dive into this, and I really hope that you guys enjoy it. So just so you know a little bit about me, I'm Amy Gardner, the Technovation Director of Curriculum, and right now, where you guys should be in the curriculum is kind of testing out your apps, working on your business plans, definitely testing and testing everything to make improvements and refining your apps before you submit in April. So during this webinar, you're going to learn more about what UX is and about why it's important in the design of mobile apps. You'll also learn about user-centered design process, see some mobile design examples at Goldman Sachs, and then Deborah will walk you through some of the tools you can use to help you get moving on the UX for your projects. Then we'll wrap up with some questions that you have for Deborah, either about UX in general or her, her job and her experiences and how and your own questions too for how UX relates to your projects. So I just wanted to mention that you can download this presentation and other materials we'll be talking about in the materials section of your panel. If you're catching up with this webinar after the recording, you should be able to access all of these materials on the Technovation curriculum part of the website. So if you do have questions during the webinar, you can definitely write them in the chat room and I'll do my best to to ask these questions during the appropriate times of the webinar, or maybe I'll hold on to them to the end when we get to the Q&A. So definitely stay tuned for the Q&A. And if you're watching this after the fact, you won't be able to ask questions directly to Deborah, unfortunately, but you can always email me, and my email is at the end of the webinar. So to start off, I thought we'd get to know Deborah a little bit more. Um, just to give her a general introduction, and then I'll let her speak. Deborah, as I mentioned, is the global head of user experience and client platforms at Goldman Sachs, and the UX group designs front-end experiences for client-facing and internal mobile and desktop, desktop applications. Deborah joined Goldman Sachs in 2007 and established the UX program in the technology division. She was named technology fellow in 2011 and managing director in 2013, and she co-leads the Women in Technology Network, which is awesome. So for those of you who might not know, and for those who do, <laughs> Goldman Sachs is an American multinational firm that engages in global investment banking, investment management, securities, and other financial services. They advise company on buying and selling businesses, raising capital, and managing risks. They help local, state, and national governments finance their operations so they can invest in infrastructure. They help develop ideas and analysis that drive new perspectives, new products, and new paths to growth. Before joining Goldman Sachs, Deborah worked at the Lehman Brothers. She also had consulted for Citibank, New York State Department of Corrections, IBM, and taught classes in computer animation and interaction design at the School of Visual Arts and Pratt Institute School of Art and Design. She earned her MFA from the University of Illinois. And her interactive installations have been on display at the Boston Computer Museum, Chicago Museum of Science and Industry, and the Bronx Museum of Arts. So that's quite a, a great list of accomplishments and a really neat background. So Deborah, can you tell us more about what some of your early interests were and what led you down the road to becoming a UX expert? Sure. Um, so thanks for having me. And special shout out to the girls in um, who are joining us today. Um, when I was in India last year, I had the pleasure of meeting the girls who were being mentored in the Technovation Challenge, and it was really inspirational and wonderful to meet everybody. Um, so my early background, I was really interested in visual arts and moving images. And so I was studying film, I was studying animation, um, and I was also really interested in computer sciences. And at the time, it was sort of really early days, um, and there, were just kind of formative ideas about how the two could be combined, meaning how, how could you create art using a computer and how did things like special effects, um, which I was really, really interested in at the time, 
um, get improved because of the advances in technology and computer graphics and animation. Um, and so I started looking for ways of combining art and technology. And so I, I thought originally that I was um, going to focus on computer animation. Um, but then I, as I started getting more involved in the industry, I realized that what I was very interested in is how people used technology and how people interacted with technology. And so this field of kind of um, how do you take how you represent information visually and combine that with technology and combine that with um, psychology, meaning how is it that people understand how to use computer systems and applications and technology in general. I looked for a way to combine all of those. Um, and I started uh, really focusing on interaction design and user experience. And so user experience is the quality of the that a person has when using an application or a system or a piece of technology. Um, and that's what I started focusing on. I became really interested in the process of software development and this synergy that could be found by combining people who knew about particular business domains and art and cognitive psychology and technology and working with that sort of collaborative group to put products in people's hands. Cool. Um, I, I didn't have a background in finance originally. I, I was always interested in it. Um, and then ultimately I just sort of ended up in a career in finance, which is really interesting in the position that I'm in now because we get to focus on lots of different types of software. We've got as a bank, we've, we're as an investment bank, we've got applications that we give to our clients. Um, we have some applications that are available to anybody who wants to learn more about Goldman Sachs. And then we've got lots and lots of applications that we're designing for every employee who works at the bank. And we've got over 30,000 people around the globe. So the idea of how do you create systems that are easy to use and, and can be fun um, and also help you get your job done is what user experience is to me and why I'm interested in it. Wow. So can we touch again on um, your definition of what user experience is? Sure. Um, so as I said, user experience is quality of experience that a person has when interacting with a system or a piece of technology. There is a kind of official definition of usability which I thought was um, very relevant for our conversation. And that is the extent to which a system product or service can be used by specified users to achieve specified goals with effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction in a specified. So there's actually a discipline around user experience. There are lots of heuristics, which is kind of a fancy word of saying design principles. And so it's not just a matter of what people think is pretty or whether you think something is intuitive. There are actually really um, definitive principles that can help define what a good user experience is. Um, but the, the point of this slide and what it's showing here is that what makes one application good is not necessarily the same criteria by which other applications can be measured because everything is the context. Who is using your application? What is it being used for? And what's the context in which it's being used? Where are people using it? Are they using it once a year? Or are they using it once a month? Or are they using it 40 times a day? Um, and so all of those things really just point to the idea that context is everything when you're designing an application. Um, another important principle, which touches on the context that I'm describing, um, and the bullet of where are people using it, is that we used to think about software as something a little bit heavier than what it is today. And we would think of software or applications as being something that people used while they were sitting at a desk in their office or at home. And now where um, some applications are being delivered via mobile technology, there's a design paradigm called thinking mobile first. And the term was coined by a gentleman called named Luke Rabluski. We have his name later in the presentation. And the idea is that when you're designing something that might be used on a mobile device as small as a smartphone, but might also be used on a tablet, and then might also be used on a desktop on some, a larger kind of form factor, what's important is to think about the smallest form factor first. And if you think about that, it forces you to design things in a very simple way. And it can be much harder to design something simple 
than it can be to design something that's very large and rich and heavy in functionality. And so by designing for mobile first, it really forces you to think simple. And then it's easier to grow from there as opposed to doing something like designing a website for a desktop and then trying to squeeze it down to fit into a tiny form factor. So the idea of mobile first is to look at both a small form factor, but also to look at the specific use cases where people will be using things in a mobile way. That's really relevant because I see a lot of students in the Technovation program asking, you know, I have all these ideas. They're really, really appropriate for a website. And we are indeed trying to get them to think mobile first. So that's a really excellent point. And particularly now that people are building responsive web apps, meaning that um, using the same implementation, you can go from something that is a large form factor to a much smaller form factor. Um, it's important to think about what the different situations are where you would be using something on a phone versus using something in a different context or a different situation. Definitely. Okay. So I put this together and I, I put together my thoughts, but what I'd encourage you to do afterwards is to really think about why is it worth designing something? And there are lots of good reasons. Here's how I kind of express it to myself in a very simple sort of way. And I think that design is important because it helps users achieve their goals quickly and easily without a lot of learning and help. So they'll be satisfied and engaged and keep using your app. And there are lots of other reasons that people will put in here. But for me, this is kind of a distillation. Um, I see a lot of groups who come up with huge lists of functions and then build something very, very powerful, but they've never given a lot of thought to design. And um, I always encourage people, you know, people say, well, we don't have time to design or, you know, we'll, we'll build something and then we'll go back and throw in a design afterwards. And so what I always encourage people to do is to think about user centered um, because it really helps refine and crystallize the things that you're trying to accomplish. And I've seen many systems built that are very rich in functionality but they never get adopted because people can't figure out how to use them or they're too complicated. And so by combining design as a layer together with the functionality and the performance of the system, you can de design and develop an app that people will really adopt and continue wanting to use. Yeah. yeah. So it sounds like we're entering kind of user-centered design territory here. <laughs> okay, so user-centered design. Um, is a process and there are methodologies behind this. I'm not going to get into these in detail and I know you're at a point where you probably put in a lot of time on your projects already that have to do with user-centered design. Um, but I've included this and there are a couple of resources in the back of this presentation that you might find useful in the designs that you're putting together. But in a user-centered design process, you're always going back to the user and making sure to keep them in the loop as you're designing and developing and testing. And so the first thing that you wanna do is to do your user research. Um, a lot of people say, well, I'm a typical user, so I'm going to design a system and develop it for somebody who suits me. Um, and if you can sort of step away from that, sure, you might be a user, but never forget to go out and talk to real people and get lots of feedback, watch people in the context in which they're gonna be using your application. And so there are different techniques that you can do to do this. One is by interviewing people and by having a focus group or just by going to talk to individuals. Another way of doing this is called contextual inquiry, where you actually go to the place where somebody is going to be using your application and you actually observe them and the type of work that they're doing. So it's really important to go out and do your user research and talk to a good sampling of people who are representative users and understand how they work and think. Um, in this process, this is where you're going to be defining things like personas and user stories and use cases. Um, so there, are, there can be lots of different tasks that are done during each of these three phases, um, but we won't get into the details of that. There's lots of really good reference material that you can find there, and I'm sure that you've done a lot of this in the projects that you're doing now. Then the next step is to start designing. And here's where you start really low fidelity. You can even 
can just take out a paper and a pencil and start sketching, ideation, coming up with all sorts of different concepts, really thinking out of the box, kind of blue sky ideas. So when you start this process, you really don't want to be constrained in any way. Just kind of have a, a, a real good brainstorming session with your team or with users in the room. And ultimately, on the design cycle, we, again, there are techniques for designing and building different types of artifacts, which are things like wire frames. Um, I'm sure you know what those are. Those are kind of line drawings that illustrate the screen composition and the different interactions of the screen. And then that might ultimately turn into a higher fidelity representation of the design, which might be full color illustrations of the screens will look like, including imagery and icons and colors and things like that. But again, this is an iterative process where you do your, your, your user research, you start sketching designs, you go back to your users and have conversations with them, you refine your designs a little bit more, and you keep having those conversations. Never do your user research and then design something and build it and then roll it out as the final project. There's always iterations, um, always keep the user involved. And then after this design site, the first design sprint, you might go on and then build something. And so I think that this is the point where you are with a lot of where some of you have already built the beginnings of your project. So after you're building, you always want to go back to your users and test. And so that kind of completes one cycle. Um, as you can see on the next slide, what we're doing is moving on to testing and getting feedback, right? So there's always something to learn at every phase. Um, and this should continue the cycle again, right? You let people use it. There are different ways of doing testing. Testing can be done even just with the, the designs on paper. You don't need to wait till you build something to go and design it. There's always good ways of getting feedback, even with paper. But once you start building it, putting the tool in the hands of people who are going to be using it is an extremely valuable step in terms of getting feedback and then being able to go back to your user research and incorporate feedback into the next iteration, right? So design, build, test, get feedback, and then go incorporate that feedback and go through another round of this user-centered design process. And we have two really good questions right now. One I can answer myself, and then I'll ask you, Deborah, the second one. Um, Arsha asks, at this stage of our curriculum, is it too late to do research, user research? And I guess my answer to that is, you know, how far have you gone already? And you do have three weeks to actually still engage people and ask and make refinements. So I would say it's not necessarily too late to do user research. And then this relates to the next question from Porva. How do you determine what is a good representative sample? And I'm wondering if you mean that in terms of user research or, you know, like how do we get the people to help test us, help test our app? So I'm wondering if, if Deborah, you could respond to like how many, what would be a good sample size of people? Um, for, for a small project like this, a good guideline that, I, that you know, is pretty common is seven plus or minus two. And so um, first of all, you don't need to think, um, and certainly not for the projects that are being done now, you don't need to go and find a hundred or a thousand people to test with. And the truth is, three, you know, even, even talking to three people can be extremely useful. Because what happens, and the reason people will say seven plus or minus two, meaning somewhere between five and nine, is that after, that's going to be enough for you to start identifying trends um, or themes in what you're hearing from people, right? So if you're hearing from people, oh my God, this is great, this is exactly what I need, um, that will tell you one thing. And if you're hearing from three people, you know, I'm not really sure how to get started here or I'm not really sure what this instruction means, right? That's really useful in terms of identifying themes. Um, so I agree with you, Amy. It's never too late to do some, some user research. Um, hopeful, and, and then the, part of the question was, how do you pick the user sampling? Well, hopefully some of the work that was done up front in terms of defining personas, for example, um, is helpful in terms of determining who you want to test with. So just for example, if your application is for girls between the ages of 15 and 19 who um, go to school in a big city, 
right? That can re that's really important for helping you define who you want to test with. Um, and then there might be different situations where you've got different types of personas for the same application. So just for example, if you're doing a marketplace type of app where you've got buyers and sellers, you would want to make sure that your, um, that your user sampling included people from both sides, both buyer, the buyer persona and the seller persona. We're, we're going to be talking about some of these templates that you guys can use towards the end of the webinar. So, and you can also download these from the materials panel. So these are resources you'll be able to directly use and they're so helpful. Okay, I think all those questions have been answered now. And I'm curious to see what some of the, the in-house apps are for Goldman Sachs and other sort of apps that have been created. Sure. So I put together different examples um, of three different categories of users that we design for at Goldman. And this is pretty common in any kind of large corporation. So we've got certain apps or websites that are available to anybody who just wants to come and take a look at them. Um, and these are, a couple of these are going, the, the examples that I'll show you will be native mobile applications and others are responsive websites. Um, so what I'm showing you here are some of the public facing apps that we've got. <clears throat> the first two you can see if you go to gs.com and these are the public website that lets you learn about the company um, what's going on in the news with Goldman, information for our investors, um, and also interesting things that are going on in the technology division of Goldman Sachs. Um, and that's where you can read, if you're interested, some of the articles about the user experience team here is if you go to gs.com slash engineering. What's on the right side of the screen is actually a native mobile application that we give to college students who are interested in applying for a position at the firm, and it's a mobile app that lets them kind of get their career started at the firm. And so these sort of are tools, you don't need to be a client, you don't need to be an employee. These are sites and tools that are available to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and so here, if we look at some of those design heuristics that I was mentioning, here's where things like visual design is important because polished and engaging and visually rich. Things like branding are important because we want everybody to know which company's website they're on. Things like clear language and terminology are important because we want people to not have to learn how to use these systems, but just be able to come here at a glance and be able to find the information that they're looking for. So if we take that and contrast it with the next example, which is an application that our investment bankers, um, we skipped one, Amy, if we can go back one, oh, sorry. Um, which our investment bankers and our banking clients use, right? This is an iPad app that we built, which lets our bankers and clients track the progress of an initial public offering or an IPO. And so you can see that in kind of the flavor of the system, there's more data here. Um, we're using some data visualizations, which are a really good way of showing big volumes of data and it's a little bit more complex and so what we're doing here is letting bankers as they're on the road track their itinerary track their meetings um, track their meetings with clients but also be able to drill down and slice into the information in different ways so that they could see who's interested in the deal and how they might price it in the best way and so here's where things like um, the, the need to maybe learn some of the system might be more acceptable because this is a system that people are using more frequently and they're also expert users. They're not just the average person who wants to learn about Goldman Sachs, but they've got a lot of expertise in banking. And so different design heuristics are important here, whereas they might not be important or different heuristics or principles were important for the public facing piece. And just to contrast that with the third example, this um, next example is actually an, a productivity tool. It's an email application that we built that is used by everybody at Goldman around the world. And you would say, well, why would anybody build their own email system? Why don't we use Gmail or Outlook or any of the tools that are out there? Well, in the business that we're in, it's very, very secure. And so we can't just use a lot of tools that are used by most people. 
And so here's a case where we built an email system and a calendaring system that's only used by the people at Goldman. And again, this is a tool that's used every minute throughout the day because people are connected to their email and calendars all the time. And so again, the design heuristics or the principles that we designed around were a little bit different here. Here we're designing for efficiency and productivity. Whereas, for example, on the website, the public website that we saw before, those weren't necessarily the principles that we were designing around. Wow. Okay. Um, and then I wanted to show you one of the tools that we built internally. So um, I think that you can get a sense from what I'm describing that at Goldman we build many, many applications. We've got about, you know, the technology organization has between eight and 9,000 people in it and we're building hundreds or even thousands of applications every year. And so from a design perspective, that presents really interesting challenges, which is how do we take these design principles and the visual styling that we apply to our apps and um, create this consistency throughout of all, all of our applications. And so what my team did was to deliver this toolkit for building responsive web user interfaces. So that means that they'll work on a desktop or tablet or mobile any size window, whether you're holding it in a vertical way or in a landscape kind of mode, and that the screen adapts accordingly. But with the tools that we built, the developers who are using it get the Goldman branding and styling straight out of the box. So they don't have to worry about it. So we take care of that problem for them. Great. Are there any questions so far about the examples Deborah has shown? If not, then we'll move forward. But I just thought I'd check in with you guys. Okay, then let's move ahead. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so here's I, what I think are the minimal steps for getting started in user centered design. Um, and I know that you've gone through some of these already, but I'll put it together from my perspective. First of all, the most valuable thing that I think you can do um, before you start is to be really clear in one sentence about what the goal of your app is. What tends to happen when we start designing and, and building something is that all kinds of great ideas come up for what features should be there, what functions should be there, and then people get really um, enthusiastic about it and they think, well, let's add this and let's add that and let's add a lot of other things. And um, what can happen if you don't really constrain yourself is that you end up with something that feels kind of bloated and we call that feature creep. It means different kinds of features keep creeping into the scope of your application. So what I find very useful is to clarify your, your goal in one sense. So an example of this might be um, my app will let people find and read news really quickly. Okay, and so then any feature that comes up as a suggestion, you can always bounce around the bounce against that and say, does this help me satisfy my goal? Yes, no, maybe, right? And so the things that are totally critical go in and the things that are no's go out and then the things that are maybe you can evaluate whether they should be in or not. But this idea of being able to have your really quick elevator pitch, what does your app do in one sentence is a really, really valuable one, both for design as well as marketing and branding and so on. Um, once you clarify your goal, it's um, very key to define personas and then user stories. And we can look at those in a minute on the next slide. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll pause there but um, because I'll, I'll describe it on the next slide. But what you're doing here is defining the types of people who would use your app and um, something called user stories, which is a little different than functions. And I'll show you that in a second. Um, after you've done that, based on your personas or user stories, is to kind of brainstorm and conceptualize and sketch and ideate, right? These are things we talked about before. Um, another really key idea that I'd like to pass on to you is this idea of an MVP. So the idea of starting small, delivering a minimum viable product. What's the smallest, most concise set of functions that you can deliver to get started? that will help, help people accomplish the goal find. And then you can always add things later on. But the first iteration of your app does not have to have all the bells and whistles that you'd like to see in it. 
And so sometimes people make the mistake of saying, oh, I'm going to wait to go to market until I've got everything in my application. And instead of doing that, I would suggest to you to go out with an MVP. And then coming back to this idea of iteration, right? You're not going to uh, put it all out there and call it a day, right? You're not done at that point. And there are always iterations to have. So design, build, test, and then go back to the drawing board and layer the next iteration on top of that. So if we take a look at the next slide, let's take a look at personas and user stories. And I just pulled these examples together. There are lots of good examples online. These are actually available to you on if you go to gs.com slash engineering. And um, Amy will, I think that we've got the link in here. You'll find these and you can just download them and get the, and, and use them if they're useful to you. The idea of a persona is that it's a representative prototypical user of your app, right? And um, again, depending on what your app is, there might be one persona or personas. But each of the different personas is a category of user who would be using your application. And just by defining a one-page persona, which includes things like um, who is this person, how savvy are they with technology, What's their specific goal? What are they trying to get out of your application? What are their typical frustrations that they might have? What are the pain points they might have? It lets you, some people even come up with, a, use a photograph and name their persona as a way of making it more personal. And this can be a way, again, as you're designing, of always going back and saying, are these features important to my persona? Would my persona care about what we're talking about right now? And how would they want to see this problem? Solved. And then what you can do with your persona is to build user stories on top of that. And I've provided a template for defining user stories. So this might be at, you know, and we phrase it in this kind of way, as a, and then here's where you would put in a type of person, I want to, and here's where you would say which action or goal you want. And here's the important part, so that and then you would fill in that sentence. And the idea here is that you're really understanding what the person wants to do and why they want to do it so that you can see, you can see if your design solves that problem for them. So um, for example, uh, if we go back to that idea that I threw out before about um, an app that's going to let you read news. So this might read something like, as a teacher, I want to read the news on my way to work so that I can sound really smart to my students and help fill them in on what the news of the day is, right? And so there's where you can say, if you're designing a news app, you're not just designing for everybody, but you're going to be able to go about it in a really targeted way where you can say, okay, here's an idea for a function. Is that going to help this teacher reading this news on the train on their way to work be able to help their class get smarter during the day? And so it helps make, make um, the solutions that you're designing much, much more personal. We have a question. And then the last yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the question is, is defining persona similar to identifying our target market? Um, it's more granular than defining your target market. So for example, your target market might be, I'll just use the example I used before, girls between 15 and 19 who go to school in a big city, right? Um, so that might be broken down into multiple personas, right? Uh, and again, totally depends on your, on your app. But depending on what it is, um, maybe there, there might be uh, a variety of personas in there. And so there might be girls who um, have not yet uh, graduated a particular grade who are interested in moving to a different school, right? That might be one persona. Another persona might be girls who are on the upper edge of that age range who might be looking at going to a university, right? And so those personas might be very, very different. Mm -hmm. Now, at the very beginning, you might come up with 10 or 15 personas, and then you might say, you know what? For our minimum viable product, we're going to focus on this one or this two. Because we, if we go too broad and try to satisfy everybody, we're not going to get anywhere. And so your target market might be very large and will probably consist of lots of different personas. And so the personas will help you hone in on which specific of functionality you want to provide for your target market. 
Excellent. Thank you for responding to that. Oh, I interrupt. Um, and then the last template is just, there are lots of these available online um, for different types of device types and form factors and so on. It's a mobile sketching template. So as you get into, you know, I was saying use these templates to just draw on, or as you get into higher fidelity design representations, you can actually use these for wireframing with different kinds of tools that are available. Um, you know, for different types of computers. Yes, we And some of the tools that are available for prototyping, I would just say, um, are really nice. I'm sure that you've got some that you use in the program. There are different ones for PCs and for Macs and for phones. But the idea of building um, clickable prototypes mm -hmm. so that you don't actually have to build all of the functionality, but you can just show somebody what it would look like if you walk through um, this, walk through different different pieces of functionality can be a really excellent way of gathering feedback before you type one line of code. And so that can be a really quick and efficient way of working out the, the design problems before you even start building. This can also be a very valuable thing to do even after you've started building. If you want to say what would this, how people are having problems with the way we, we see people in our testing, we see them having problems with this path through the system. You can even just go back with sketch or with clickable prototypes with, that have not yet been built to try it out a different way and get feedback on those prototypes. Great. We did have a question, but I'm not sure it's relevant right now, so it might need to be answered at the end. Um, what database do you use at Goldman Sachs? Um, we use lots of different databases. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we use lots of different databases. We've got a very large organization and depending on what we're trying to, you know, the problems that we're trying to solve, um, whether they're related to the markets and securities or whether they're related to employees or other kinds of um, data that we thought we've got lots of different databases. Yeah, I think in the most cases for tech innovation, they're going to be using tiny DB. So, you know, for App Inventor. <laughs> so, but that is an interesting question. It's not totally relevant to this yet. So. Okay, are there any other, should we move on to the resources slide? Sure. Um, so I think some of my favorite resources and tools that are available for free online. Um, this is really just a small sampling of them. There are tons that are available. I'm sure you, you um, have ideas that you, of your own that you would add to this list. Um, the ones on the right are, the, are a few that I picked, and actually the first two I'll mention because they're so, pervasive and salient in the user experience um, industry that I think that you might want to take a look at them. The first one is an oldie but a goodie. So this is um, 10 usability heuristics for user interface design. And I would probably guess that this um, definition, which was by the Nielsen Norman group, probably came out over 20 years ago. That's still relevant to what we do today. They're kind of these high level principles that are useful for any interaction between a person and a computer. And they have things, they, they have principles like the system should provide feedback about what's going on at all times. Um, or there should be clear indications to the user of where you are in the system. So how you actually go about designing them today versus 20 years ago is obviously very, very different. But they're an excellent set of guiding principles. And then the second one, which I mentioned before, is by Luke Rabluski, and it's mobile first, which we were talking about. Have any, has anyone in the audience used any resources they can recommend? If so, just type it in the chat room. <laughs> I always like learning from our students too to see what they like using. I don't think I see any questions, so <laughs> we can go forward. So I just wanted to share with you some of the really exciting um, work that that Goldman has been able to help with in the Technovation Challenge. So um, in 2014, it was our first time where we, in our um, Bengaluru office in India, started mentoring girls. Um, we did it last year as well. We're doing it this year. We 
you've got about 60 girls on different teams. And I have to say, I was able, I had the really great opportunity to meet the girls who were um, working on, a, on the project last year. And I, I, I'm absolutely sure that I was more inspired by them than what they were by me. <laughs> it was just such a pleasure um, seeing the excitement and the enthusiasm. The ideas coming up with was, were just amazing and bold and brave. Um, and looking for ways to make a change in their communities by creating an app that would that would um, you know manifest in some change and help people I thought was just really astounding um, and so uh, actually last year's one of the classes one of the groups that we mentored actually came to San Francisco and won won the World Pitch Challenge with their app called Silicio um, and so uh, waste and trash disposal is actually a pretty significant problem in India. Um, and so this app looked at a way to give people the incentive to uh, get rid of their waste in a um, profitable way and in a way which would help the community by keeping it cleaner. And so they designed and um, pitched and won the pitch for this app that would help connect buyers and sellers of dry waste, get rid of that in an economical, um, and environmentally friendly way. And so a lot of the design principles that we were talking about, you know, that we were mentioning both from Nielsen's 10 usability heuristics um, and more, pre, you know, before that in terms of what does usability mean factor in here, like using clear and simple language, making the screens flow in a way that makes sense to people, um, looking at who the target audience is and being clever about how you get people to adopt and incentivize users to use an application, right? We're really um, important in terms of designing and pitching this app. And so it was really, you know, it was a really great experience. Um, and I hope that some of you will be sharing in that uh, in the 2016 competition. Mm -hmm. Deborah, do you have any comments on the UX of the screenshots we have from this team? Um, it's a little bit hard to see in this example. Well, some of the things that I noticed about it is that it tried to be uh, clear and concise and not very cluttered. Um, that the call to actions, meaning what do you do next, were clear, meaning um, there wasn't too much information on the screen. It was laid out in a linear way. So, you know, sometimes it's actually useful to take a step back and just kind of squint your eyes and look at, and look at a, a design of something which you can kind of do if you um, if you look at this in a small way. And so if you look at the part of the green, you know, the screen that's all the way on the left side of these four green screens, right, these are four little um, uh, phone images put together, you can sort of see that um, it reads, it's got four fields, it's got instructions um, in each of the fields, so you know what to tell you about how long they should be. And then there's one call to action, that black button on the bottom of the screen. And so you can see that that's just an example of how you kind of lead somebody through a screen so that they know what to do in a simple and clear way and what the very, very specific next step would be if there's only one step. Um, Arsha is asking, is there something you think might be improved upon in this app? Or, you know, comments to that? Just because I know that the girls working on these now are going to be thinking about how to make the best possible user experience? Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to say in the abstract what what you can do. And again, you know, I can comment on this and I've got my, you know, design hat on as a professional. But what I, I would say is it's more important what the users of this app think about it than what I do. And so what I would say to you again is um, You've probably been working in groups, bouncing your ideas off of people and working together for a while now. What I do personally is sometimes I'll take a design home and show it to my kids, um, or I'll show it to a colleague I work with who has never seen it before. And that's where you can get a lot of really good feedback by somebody who's never laid eyes on it before, who can give you kind of immediate feedback um, or can dig into a problem with you. Don't keep having the conversation with the same people and never get outside of that group. Definitely good advice. 
Okay, then I'm wondering if you have any concluding comments, Deborah, before we move on to the Q&A, or if anyone has questions that relate specifically to the presentation. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll throw something out as people are, um, you know, hopefully people will have questions. I'd love to hear a few more. Um, so, you know, I, here's where you can find out more about um, the things that we've been talking about and the work that my team has done. But what I would say is that there are so many um, interesting roles in technology, and there are so many interesting positions that you might play on a development team or a product team, um, that if there's one angle that you like a lot or one angle that you really don't like, it doesn't take you in or out of um, any of the careers in STEM or any of the careers in technology development. So, you know, if you look at somebody like me, I come from a fine arts background. You might never have thought, well, how did this person, you know, this person is never going to end up in, a, in the financial sector in a technology division, right? It's kind of a, an unusual place. But when I look around at the skills of the people on my team, some of us are developers, right? They actually sit and code. Some of us are I, on our team, we've got visual designers. We've got people who focus on interaction design. We've got people who focus on business analysis. Um, we've got people who focus on product management and getting people to adopt the applications that we build. We've got people who focus on marketing, right? So your passion might be development, but your passion might be something that's related to how you build product and how you get the business value out of your product, right? So if you're an engineer, super. Um, but if you love technology and you don't love programming, there are lots of different roles that you can play that can get you off to a start in a career in technology. What I love is that all these fields kind of intersect with each other and that you can have a particular skill but fit into a team like this. That's so exciting. And that's what's fun to me, right? We're, none of us are sitting in a room by ourselves uh, coding all day, right? That's not how it works. It's really a team effort where everybody brings their different skills and their different experience and their different perspective. And to me, that's what really makes the work fun and interesting and what gets the, you know, gets the best out of all of us. Great. Okay, so I think I'm just going to mention here, take a moment to mention the judging rubric. I don't have a slide for it, but you guys can download it either on the Tech Innovation website in, in the resources section or the materials section in this webinar. Um, we just wanted to point out that judges will be looking at your app submissions and what they're looking for regarding your user interface is, um, the big question there is, is this intuitive? Is it easy to use? Um, so Deborah has gone into a lot of points on this and I'd like you to reflect on those because you know, you can get a certain number of points for this. And I think when you're writing your product description, as she mentioned before, think about how you can distill the description into one or two sentences so that it's really in alignment with what you're trying to do with your app. And, and that is also reflected in how people interact with it. You also need to create a two minute demo video. And this is where you get the opportunity to show Exactly, you know, someone who's going through the app and using it. <clears throat> so think of a good way to present that and keep that in mind as you're developing your app. And so um, another thing is, is all the functionality there that was described in your product description. Um, do you have too many features? Is there feature creep? As a term that I just learned that I love. <laughs> So think about your minimum viable product and think about, you know, how you can make your app really interesting to someone and really usable because it's really taking care of a need someone has. A question. Oh, no, it wasn't a new question. Sorry. So now we have a few more minutes if Deborah has time for a question or two that relate to your particular apps. So if anyone would like to write their question in the chat room. We probably have a minute or so for that. And in the meantime, oh wait, here's one. Porva asks, do you think users like an app better if there are many features on one screen or spread out across many screens? That's a great question. 
um, what I would do is go back to the who, what, and where. <clears throat> so I can give you an example of, um, you know, one type of application that we build is for people who are trading securities and they want, they can never get enough information on the screen <clears throat> or, excuse me, or the more, as far as they're concerned, the more the better, right? And then if you think of, if you've ever gone, I'm sh you know, I'm sure some of you have gone to a cash machine and you want to get $20 out of the cash machine, you don't want a lot of functions. You don't want a lot of words, right? All you want is to get your $20 out of the bank. Um, you know, that's a, that's a totally different who, what, and where. And so I would say the context is key. What I, what I think for these pitches, for the pitch videos, right? One of the questions, Amy, that you said was, is it intuitive? Right, that really comes down to the principles, right? Intuitive is, is a pretty vague word for saying, was it easy to use? Did I get it? Um, and again, it comes back to those heuristics that I mentioned. But generally, when you're pitching something, you want it to be really kind of clear and you want to be able to walk somebody through it and have them say, oh, yeah, I get it, even though they've only seen it for 60 seconds, especially if you're doing a two-minute pitch video. And that's where something that feels too complicated might not sell very well. And so I would say for the apps that you're building, particularly for the MVP, that probably simpler is better. And that um, particularly when you're telling a story around your app, being able to quickly lead somebody through it and let them have that aha moment very quickly is probably um, more important to go simple rather than super highly functional. Neat. Any other questions before we wrap it up? <laughs> we covered so much. It's been so wonderful. So I'm going to begin by saying, um, <laughs> if you found this webinar interesting or helpful, please do consider joining us for our next two, which involve the topic of pitching. And this is such an important topic that we're doing too, because they're going to focus on two different things. So. The first one will be generally, how do you create a winning pitch and presentation on April 4th? And the second one goes a little deeper into how do you respond to questions about your app? Because it's really important to be able to, to accept questions and to know how to respond um, and give yourself space and time to think and also rehearse. Rehearsing is incredibly important. So please do consider joining those. And remember that you can access the materials that we talked about today in the materials panel of your screen or on the Technovation curriculum website if you're just tuning in after the webinar. And I just want to thank everybody who joined with such great questions, who stayed up late in India to join us. That was fantastic. And especially enormous thank you to Deborah Hirschman from Goldman Sachs. Do, Deborah, do you have any concluding comments or anything you'd like to say before we go? Yeah, so first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. I hope this was um, useful or at least a little interesting to some of you. Um, I would just, <clears throat> I think this, um, this program is just amazing. I wish something like this had been around when I was younger. And um, I would just kind of say kudos to Iridescent and the Technovation Challenge um, for making this available. It's amazing to see what the girls are producing. You know, you, you are, like I said, I, I think um, you're beyond me. I think that you're inspiring um, the adults who are working on this with you probably more than, you know, we're, we're giving you, you tools. <laughs> and you're the future, right? So you're inspiring us, and you guys are going to change the world. So um, I, I, I'm just amazed at the work that's been doing. And I also just love, um, Amy, the way your organization is using technology to teach technology. Um, <laughs> so the idea that we can do this virtually around the world, um, I just kind of still find that magical. So really great work that you're doing. It's really fun and wonderful to be a part of it. Thank you so much. That's such a generous thing to say. And I am so inspired by all the girls that I've met and all the app ideas. You guys really are courageous. And it's really great. We are just providing you tools and a framework to, to solve your own problems. And I love that you're using technology to tackle them. 
So I think on that note, we're going to say goodbye. And I will send you all the materials in, a, in another note afterwards. And I just wanted to thank you so much. Okay, bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>